Hello, Saints. On behalf of the BE Holy Ministries family, we welcome you to our worship service. Today is September the 22nd, 2024. To the title of our lesson for this morning's Sunday School is titled Improbable Possibilities. We're coming out of Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. This morning, our Bible truth reads, God is willing to forgive and bring recovery healing and restoration. Our memory verse is call unto him and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Coming out of Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter and the third verse. Our lesson today focus on Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the second through the 11th verse which is a message from God delivered through the prophet Jeremiah to the, to the people of Judea. In this passage, God speaks a hope during a time of deep despair. The city of Jerusalem is on the verge of destruction, on the verge of destruction because the people's disobedience. Yet in the midst of impeding judgment, God promises to bring recovery, healing, and restoration. The lesson reminds us that even when life feels broken beyond repair, in this passage, broken God beyond repair, God is able to restore all things. Our memory verse this morning it's Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, and the third verse, and it reads, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. This verse encourages us to call on God in faith, knowing that he will respond in ways that exceed our expectations. Our lesson aim this morning reads, by the end of this lesson, each student should realize that God's promise to follow punishment with forgiveness and restoration is still valid today. Affirm that God's process of punishment, forgiveness, and healing comes as a package. Each is a step towards spiritual restoration. Design a thanks of offering to express gratitude for the hope, healing, and forgiveness we received from God. Our background scriptures for a deeper understanding, if we could reflect on Isaiah the 12th chapter and its passage in scriptures, it is a strong, it is a song of praise that celebrates God's restoration and celebration. Our Bible learning, the key takeaway from today's lesson is that God always keeps his promises. Even when we experience his correction, it is never without hope of future restoration. Like the people of Judea, we may face challenges that seem overwhelming, but we can trust in God. We can trust that God will bring us through to a place of healing and abundance. Our life needs for today's lesson is for all of us at one, at one point in life, we face situations where we did not know which direction to turn or what steps to take next. Much like the people of Judea who were lost in their rebellion. We sometimes lose our way. 
The good news is that God's guidance, forgiveness, and restoration are always available when we seek him. Our Bible application our Bible application reads, Christians struggle to act on the faith that God will fulfill promises of, re promises of restoration. Just as God promised the people of Judea renewed prosperity and security after their period of judgment, he promised the same to us today. Yet, as Christians, we often struggle to fully trust that God will keep his promises a restoration. This lesson challenges us to take hold of God's promises with faith, even when the circumstances seem hopeless. At this time, please stand, and we're going to go over our scripture lessons for this morning, which are coming from Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. I will start with the 2nd verse, and we will alternate, therefore. Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. And the 2nd verse reads, Thus said the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They come to fight with the children, but it is to fill them with the advice of men. Whom I have slain in my anger and in my fury, and for all who wickedness I have hid my face from the city. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will call the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and will fill them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it, and it shall, shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall, shall hear all the good that I do unto them. them. And, and they, they shall fear and, and tremble for all, all the goodness, goodness and for all the prosperity that I will cure unto them. Thus says the Lord, again there shall be heard in this place, which ye all say be dissolute, without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are dissolute, without, ma without man and without Inhabited and without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever, and of them shall bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return. The captivity of the land, as at first, said the Lord. Amen. Thank you. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. Again, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Today is September the 22nd. We're on lesson four. The title of our lesson this morning is called Improbable Possibilities. We are coming out of Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. The big idea for today is this. 
God's power to restore is greater than our capacity to imagine. When we are in the midst of trials or punishment, we might think recovery is impossible. However, God is in the business of making the improbable possible. His promises of healing, forgiveness, and restoration are always fulfilled, even when we cannot see how. To help us to understand the message of Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse, we need to consider the context in which Jeremiah was written. Context will show us why God's promise of restoration was so powerful during this time and how it still applies to us today. The book of Jeremiah takes place during a time of crisis in Judea. The people had turned from God to idolatry, leading to the Babylonian army preparing to destroy J Jerusalem. Jeremiah had warned the people, but his message was ignored. While in prison, he delivered God's promise of future restoration. Even as Jerusalem was on the verge of collapse. This promise revealed that after judgment, God would heal and restore his people. Judea's culture had fallen into rebellion against God, embracing idolatry and disobedience. As a result, the nation faced judgment. Despite their disobedience, God extended his grace, promising that after punishment, there would be forgiveness and renewal. Jerusalem, Judea's capital, was under siege and near destruction. The city once was a symbol of God's presence. It had become a place of suffering. Yet, this same city would be the site of God's promised restoration. We know Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, delivered messages of both judgment and hope. His life was marked by personal sorrow as he watched his people and city fall. Even so, he remained faithful in proclaiming God's promise of future restoration. The original audience was the people of Judea, suffering the consequences of their sin. This message of hope was for a broken nation. Today, we can see ourselves in their story, as we too experience a need for God's forgiveness and restoration. Our daily reading for this week, which came out of Isaiah and Jeremiah, we're going to start with Monday's reading, which is titled, In Returning, We Shall Be Saved. And that is coming out of Isaiah, the 30th chapter, the 9th to the 17th verse. Isaiah, the 30th chapter, the 9th through the 17th verse. Pastor Newsom, could you please read that for me? Isaiah, the 30th chapter, the 9th through the 17th verse, and the title of that lesson for Monday is In Returning, You Shall Be Saved. Isaiah, the 30th, the 30th chapter, verses 9 through 17. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, 
prophesy deceit. Get ye out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perversiousness and stay thereon. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out of the high walls, whose breaking cometh suddenly at the, in, an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shred to take fire from the hearth, or to take water with all out of the pit. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall ye be shall be your strength, and ye would not. But ye said no, for we will flee for upon horses, therefore shall ye flee, and will we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the town, top of the mountain, and as an ensign on a hill. Amen. Thank you for reading Isaiah the 30th chapter, the 9th through the 17th verse. Monday's reading, which was titled, In Returning, You Shall Be Saved. We know in Isaiah's time, the people of Israel were relying on military allegiance or alliances and, have, and human strategies for protection instead of trusting in God or in God's salvation. They rejected the message of repentance, seeking quick fixes and smooth words that align with their desires. They refused to believe that returning to God in repentance and rest could save them. Today, we often seek solutions to life's challenges through human wisdom and self-reliance. We may reject God's way because it seems too simple or improbable, preferring to lean on our own <coughs> understanding. Bless you. The lesson of this passage is, the, is that returning to God and trusting his timing and methods, no matter how unlikely they seem, is the path to salvation and peace. Our Tuesday's reading is titled, Where Are Your Gods? And we're coming out of second Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th through the 32nd verse. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th through the 32nd verse. Pastor Edwards, could you read Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th through the 32nd verse, please? Amen. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th through the 32nd verse says, As the chief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. But there, where are thy gods? And thou has made thee, let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smited your children. They receive no correction. Your own sword have devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore, say my people, we are lords. 
we will come no more unto thee. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th and the 32nd verse. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the 26th through the 2nd verse, our Tuesday's reading was titled, Where Are Your Gods? We know that the Israelites had turned to idols, lifeless, powerless creations of their own hands, and rejected the living God who had rescued them. They only remembered God in times of crisis and then blamed him for their troubles when the false gods they worshiped failed them. In modern times, many turn to materialism, career success, and right. even relationships as gods in their lives. These idols offer temporary comfort but fail in times of true crisis. This passage challenges us to examine what we, what we rely on in tough times and reminds us that only God can truly save and restore us even when all other options seems more tangible. Our Wednesday's reading is coming from Jeremiah, the third chapter, the 11th through the 15th verse. Jeremiah, the third chapter, the 11th through the 15th verse, which is titled, I will bring you to Zion. Evangelist Newsom, could you please read Jeremiah, the third chapter, the 11th through the 15th verse. And the Lord said unto me, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Mm. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, said the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, said the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, said the Lord. Turn, O, o backsliding children, said the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Amen. Thank you for reading Jeremiah, the third chapter, 11th through the 15th verse, which was titled, I will bring you to Zion. We know that through Israel, though Israel had sinned by worshiping idols, God still offered mercy and a path to restoration if they acknowledged their wrongs and returned to him. God's desire was to bring his people back to himself and give them leaders who would guide them in truth. God's invitation to return to him is still open to us today. Even when we stray, God's desire is to forgive, heal, and to guide us back. When we repent, he provides spiritual leaders and the Holy Spirit to feed us with wisdom and understanding, helping us to grow. As of right now, do anybody have any questions to Monday through Wednesday's reading? Any questions or comments to Monday's through Wednesday's reading as of now? Well, I was, I was looking at what you said earlier. Uh, after punishment, God will heal them. That implies that uh, when we as children of God mess up, God is going to heal us, but before he heals us, he's going to punish us. 
for our disobedience, for our iniquities or whatever they are. We're not going to go unpunished. You know, I think about the scripture where it says that God chastises those he loves. And a child that is out with, that is without correction, the Bible called him a bastard. You know, so I thank God that God loves us enough that when we do mess up, and even though it seems like it may be improbable, impossible for us ever be restored or redeemed, there's nothing, as in Jeremiah 32 and 27, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Amen. But all we have to do is repent, do like David did, acknowledge our sins and our transgressions. God can not only restore us, but he can heal us. Amen. Amen. We do not. It's on. We we do not always know which way to go or where to turn at certain point in our life. You know, it sometimes you know trouble come on our way, and it seems like we don't we don't know the the direction you know in which to to get out of it. You know, but God is telling us that all we have to do is just call upon His name. And that is all, and he will answer us. He, he, he has said it in his words, you know. And the Bible said that God is not a man that he will lie. God is, is faithful to his promise. All, right. all we have to do is just acknowledge God. that we have done wrong. Come on. That's all. Just, a, just, just acknowledge that we've done wrong and ask God for forgiveness. And God will forgive us for anything we have done that is wrong. Oh, how wonderful our God is. How merciful our God is. Oh, I just thank the Lord for his goodness and his mercy. Because his mercy is, is the last forever, the Bible says. Amen. Not willing that any should perish. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And um, I was reminded as um, I heard all of the comments and just, you know, studying the lesson, you know, we should be reminded as well that this judgment, once God passes judgment, we see that can't be undone. God's judgment is final. But we see now it wasn't to the detriment, it was to what? Draw them back to himself, glory to God. Because see, this judgment that now had been passed was what? Because they would do what? Continue to reject God. So it's not to put fears though that as soon as you screw up, you know, God's gonna come and hammer you and pronounce judgment on you. It's the fact that God will send warning after warning, message after message. So we should be reminded if you're receiving warning after warning, message after message. At some point, we'll find that God, there will be judgment. And once that judgment is passed, that judgment is final. But at the same time, we see after the judgment had been passed, we see there that there's also hope. Amen. Yes, I, I like what he said. Um, I, it put me in mind of 1 John 1, where it say, if we say we, um, I don't want, well, yeah, I could go there. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But then when we, on this lesson the ninth verse, it say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, uh, and then the second verse says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Mm -hmm. So here I see that God is a faithful God, and that he loves us, and he don't want any soul to perish. And so um, this lesson shows me how much God would do to to bring us back in relationship with him. And today we're experiencing the promises of God that he made to Israel and how that, you know, we have Jesus who is our, you know, the propitiation of our sins, you know, and he is our high priest. So I thank God for this lesson today because it reminds me of the faithfulness of God where the, the, the uh, scriptures say, Great is his faithfulness. His mercies, they are new every morning. And that his compassions, they fail not. So I just thank God for that. Yes, Evangelist Handy. I, I love what I hear. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, as we look at the history of time, I like what the pastor said. 
is God always gives us a chance out there. And because of the nature of man, there's that potential that we will stray at times. Just because we stray, God does not condemn us, more especially those who've been called. Uh, he's got to get our attention, as I hear um, uh, Newsom said, uh, he chasing those he loved. But I like it's this history here because these are his people. And they've been worn, worn, worn. It's just like they're stiff neck, as Moses call them in the wilderness, as God called them. Uh, and he's got to get their attention. Sometimes it takes that that ride, that strong, I lost the words, to get us back to him. Uh, he never forget that, especially those he had called. Uh, his, his fulfilling his is not just promised uh, prophecy here. Uh, like what Deke said, uh, he's not a man who should lie. Uh, if, he, if he wiped him out, he, he, he would, he, he would uh, uh, go against his own prophecy that he had uh, 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 given. So I like the way this lesson is going and how we read these scriptures and correlate and whatever. That's what it's all about. Even the, the sinner out there has the opportunity. And we cannot beat them down so bad. I've met people who gave up all hope because of their situation and badness, I mean, uh, what they've done. God can't forgive me for this. He can. This is a beautiful lesson. Thank you. Amen. Sister Diane, did you have a comment? Amen. Yes. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. Um, this has been awesome. All that I have been um, hearing and listening to and for me I look at it as yeah I can say in agreement with everything that's being said God is my father he deals with me like I'm a child it made me think about when I was a child how much my parents loved me but if I was wrong they punished me but yet they still loved me brought me back into them and then when Elder Handy said even a sinner, you know, our commandment is to love one another as God has loved us. So even if that sinner comes versus me being saved, a sin is still a sin from what I understand. And if I know how to ask God for his forgiveness, you know, he'll take me in. Same thing with a sinner. Once we talk to them and explain to them, if you ask God to forgive you and you mean it, God is going to forgive you and let it go. But at the end of the day, if you keep on and keep on and keep on, doesn't scripture say also <laughs> reprobated mind? Sometimes as parents or family members, that one that don't want to do right, we have to kind of pull back and, 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 and put that person on hold. Put that person on the sideline until God say, okay, give me some more instructions. Amen. 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 Thank you. So to, I, I, was, I, was, I listened to everybody. I love everything, and I heard what Pastor Edward said: how God do these things to do, you know, f not for our detriment. And I looked at the Lord as my shepherd; I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. Why? This is what I want to get to: the for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And if we don't understand when they talk about the rod and that staff, you know, the rod, you know, it, it, that is what that is. That symbolizes a man, the correction, the, the staff symbolizes the protection. Thank you, sister. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, so uh, and also the rod is also symbolized how God will ward off our enemies as well. You know, and, uh, and the staff, once again, is our guiding tool to keep us on that straight and narrow. Like Pastor Edwards, not to our detriment, but because he loves us. He has invested so much in us. Amen. And God wants to protect his investment. Thank you, Sister Teacher. Amen. Are there any more comments? Yeah, just one. Uh, uh, thank you for that last comment. Uh, and that's beautiful. Uh, as we teach, I like... Ah, uh, uh, oh Lord, I'm so, forgive me this one. I'm moving a little slow. Uh, the comment I hear pastors after his own heart that's what it's about 
when we talk through the understanding of, of the scripture, maybe to teach it in such a way that a person understands who this God is, this God who is, is the creator of all things, soft. He loves that which he created. When I grasp that concept, it changed my world upside down. I, I know a lot of time I've been in this journey, all the emphasis has been on uh, people going to hell, this and that, and been on the saints and whatever, but I, when I understand the concept of God and what he did, uh, how he did it throughout history, uh, and as I hear, and one of my scriptures, he don't want not one to be lost. But first he got to get the attention of those he have called who embraced him. And I, I like what Pastor Edward said, they have deceived him. Yet they deceived him, he still uh, uh, give them hope. He hasn't forsaken them. But then I like that scripture as I was studying Jeremiah, the, uh, uh, the 13th chapter. And now I hear my... Uh, uh, and that said, I'm sorry to uh, call you, uh, I used to call it, uh, Sister Newsom, uh, uh, pastors after God's own heart. And when I correlate that scripture throughout Jeremiah, the Old Testament, and, and, and realize what, what it was meant when I see it in, in Roman there, uh, it's about teaching those who would do that which God commanded them to do and get the people to understand. Doesn't matter whether I'm in him or not. Those who have ear, let him listen. I let him see. Thank you. Beautiful. Amen. Thank you for those comments. We're going to go to Friday's reading, which is titled The Hope of Israel. The Hope of Israel. And we're going to come from Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the 12th through the 17th verse. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter the 12th through the 17th verse. Mother Abney, could you please read that? Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the 12th through the 17th verse, please. Yes, ma'am, 12 through 17. And it reads, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. All right. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake, thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, right. because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O oh Lord, Heal and me. I shall be healed. Right. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Behold, that. they say unto me, <laughs> Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me, thou art my hope in the day of evil. All right. All right. Amen. We read Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the 12th through the 17th verse. Here, Jeremiah declares God as Israel's only hope. That's it. Through people's reject, though people rejected God's living waters and chose their own paths, Jeremiah's prayer for healing and salvation shows that God is the only source of true life and hope. Like Jeremiah, we too must recognize that God alone is our hope and salvation. When the world tempts us to forsake God for temporary pleasures, we must turn to him as our true sanctuary and source of healing, especially in the times of trouble. Do anyone have any comments on Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the 12th through the 17th verse? Yes, I was looking at that and it gave me hope even the more, <laughs> you know, and this song came to mind where it say, if he have to reach way down, Jesus will pick you up. And, uh, and so uh, it lets me know uh, over and over again that God will not leave us in a, in a uh, down and out situation. He will lift us up. 
and uh, God is our hope. And uh, I'm reminded of the scripture in Psalms where it say that he is my hope and he's the lifter up of my glory and the lifter up of my head. Because many times we don't have the answers to life situations. And sometimes we, we do fail God, but he won't leave us. He won't give up on us. He will show us the way out and to help us to get back up again. And that way he's already made is to come and confess our sins. And they say that he will is faithful and just to forgive us. But we have to trust God that he will forgive us. Sometimes we beat up ourselves and, and it makes it so hard for us to get up again. And when we beat up ourselves, here come the devil. Because we open the door for him to, to help us beat up ourselves. And so, but we know here in the word of God that God is a faithful God. And he loves his people. He is our hope. Jeremiah stood his grounds on trusting God. He didn't go to the other gods of the people. He didn't go to the gods of the land, but he went to the true God, the God that was able to help. And God is still our hope in today. He is the hope of our glory, and he is able to lift up our heads in situations of trouble and of distress. God is able to give us joy. Amen. Thank you for those comments. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. One thing I was looking at, uh, this is one of the scriptures where you see Jeremiah inserts himself, you know. And I love the way he put it in the 16th verse. Out of all that was going on with Israel and, and Judah, you know. Uh, Jeremiah let know, I have not ran away from being a shepherd. I have not ran away from my responsibility. Amen. It's been tough sometimes. It's been tough because these folks don't want to listen to me. He said, but I have not ran away from my responsibility. I have not hastened from being a pastor. I may be an unpopular pastor, but I have not hastened from being a pastor. I love the way Jeremiah inserted himself because this was, this was not easy for him, you know, and especially when he, every time he spoke the truth, they just threw him back in the dungeon. But he said, look here, out of all I've been through, I still have joy. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah. Jeremiah uh, had faith in God. You can see that. He said, even in this situation he was in, I mean, he, with the people of Israel, he said, heal me. He, he was able to cry out to God for his situation. When he said, heal me, O Lord, and I shall, he said, I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. And he said, for thou art my praise. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you in hell because I know you can do it. And, you know, and this is Jeremiah's commitment to the call of God upon his life, you know. Even in the midst of persecution, in the midst of opposition, Jeremiah said, I remain steadfast to my role. I love it. All right. <laughs> Yes. Amen. Uh, Evangelist Handy, you had some comments? Yeah, I love that. You know, he called me, started laughing, and rejoicing. Uh, it made me think about uh, in the New Testament when uh, uh, Jesus asked his disciple, uh, Do you want to leave too? Uh, they said, Where can we go? Uh, I like that comment that was made. Uh, it made me think, using my imagination, where could Jeremiah turn to? But God. That's right. Yeah. Oh, but, 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 but then, see, see yeah, I, I, I'm about to get happy now. I feel my strength coming on. Uh, but if I go back to the 13th chapter, the 12th and 13th chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah wasn't supposed to be a, alone by himself. The Bible talks about where was all the other pastors? Where was all the prophets? But yet Jeremiah found himself out there by himself. But yet he refused to turn to any other idol god. Where else could he turn but God himself? I, I, I like that comment. Where can we find leaders today who's not afraid? Yet so many have abandoned the ship in their teaching. But yet he seek the Lord to continue to do that which he was called to do. Even Jeremiah talks about, uh, to start from the 12th chapter up to where we're at in that day. Feed them, feed them. We got it in the New Testament. Jesus addresses uh, uh, those, feed my sheep. Where are they today? 
Oh man, this is a beautiful. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you all for those wonderful comments. Um, we're going to go into our lesson, which comes from Jeremiah, the second chapter and the 11th verse. Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the second through the 11th verse, which is our lesson today is entitled Improbable Possibilities. As we go into the lesson, we're going to see how God introduced himself as the creator and the sustainer of all things. So, Deacon Hunt, could you please read Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, and the second verse, please? Amen. Jeremiah, 33rd chapter, the second verse says, Thus said the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it. To establish it, the Lord is his name. Amen. Here in this verse, we can see how God introduces himself as the creator and the sustainer of all things by saying, the Lord is his name. He emphasizes his authority and power. He is not only the one who created the world, but also the one who will, who will reestablish order and restoration for his people. This is the declaration of God's ability to fulfill what he promises. He is the source of all creation and thus capable of restoring what is broken. For its application, God, as the creator, has the power to restore anything that is broken in our lives, just as he promises to reestablish Jerusalem after its destruction, he is capable of bringing order and healing to areas in our lives where we fall hopeless or lost. Do anyone have any comments on verse 2? If not, we're going to go. Uh, it's self-explaining, you know. I mean, he's he, he telling you that, he's telling them that uh, he, he's, the, he's the God that made this world, you know. And he's the God that got the solution, you know. He, created, he, he started it. He can end it, you know. All he needs is just them to repent. And, and one thing I was looking at, that this came to Jeremiah. You read the first verse. Even though it's not included in here, this came to Jeremiah the second time while he was still shut up in the dungeon in the courts of the prison. Amen. Amen. And Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter and the third verse. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was looking at something that stuck out to me in the second verse. He said, uh, and the Lord that formed it. And then to say, to establish it. So I was looking at that and I was, I can understand that to establish it is the people of Jerusalem in the city. And so um, God is talking about what he is going to do for Israel and what he said he already going to do. He's just reestablishing and making it plain of what he has already said. Amen. Thank you. The word maker refers to God as the creator who shapes and forms everything with purpose and precision. The word establish is to make firm or stable, implying that God is reestablishing what he has disrupted or lost. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter and the third verse, which reads, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Here, God invites his people to call upon him in prayer, promising that he will answer and reveal things beyond their understanding. The term great and mighty implies that these are things of great significance. 
secrets and future events that only God knows and controls. This verse highlights God's willingness to communicate with his people and his ability to show them solutions and insights beyond their human capacity. The word call is to cry out or summon with expectation. This word emphasizes, emphasizes the act of intentional prayer and seeking God's presence. The word mighty refers to fortified and inaccessible things, inaccessible things, symbolizing the profound mysteries of God's plan that can only be revealed through divine intervention. Or intervention, sorry. Do anyone have any questions on verse 2 or verse 3 of Jeremiah, the 33rd I, chapter I, and the third verse? I kind of like what uh, the response I hear about establishing as I look at call upon me. Uh, and as far as context, we said Jeremiah was in prison and there in the courts. This thing now, as we talked about, uh, because of what they've done, you know, judgment is here. When I say here, it was upon them. Uh, they went through uh, 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 Israel as a whole nation, the southern kingdom. Now this thing is, is targeting uh, Judah. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the northern nation already went. Now this uh, uh, judgment is coming upon Judah, the southern nation. Which we talk about David and that range of David that he, uh, this great king shall come down to. Uh, so, uh, as I was studying this and looking at this, going to be careful how we handle this thing. Uh, they're going to go through the judgment. But at the same time, uh, is it possible we go through? I have the saying how many times do we praise God when God is uh, chastising us, when He's uh, spanking it upon us? We will still call upon his name. He's still merciful and forgiven, isn't he? So I, I like this, you know, uh, in this context. What, what is Jeremiah saying to the people now? They, this judgment uh, that I hear earlier is because of what they did. It's upon them. But at the same time, God is still a merciful God. He's still going to fulfill his prophecy and the promises in that. So how do we see this thing in context? How do we see it in our lives when it becomes gloom and doom and this thing is upon me I can't see? Amen. I like what uh, Evangelist Handy said uh, because it even puts me in the mind when I look at the scripture, when God speaks to Jeremiah, like uh, Evangelist Handy said, they are suffering. Their land is desolate. And the enemy has the upper hand. And everything, if you look with the natural eyes, everything looks hopeless. You're in the hands of your enemy. And, and they have taken the king captive and, they, and um, many other people captive. And uh, the land is land desolate. The sanctuary, the temple is destroyed. And so their hope, when you, you think of it, when they look, they, the hope is, is gone. But look how God comes to Jeremiah. He comes uh, with the, uh, the way he comes. He's, he's telling them who he is and trying to uh, instill hope to them. Notice he said, I am the maker, the Lord, the maker, the self-existent one. And then he goes, I am the one who formed you know it. I'm the one who established it. So he's like trying to build up the 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 faith and the strength, you know, um, and the understanding of who he is as God, and that he can do this. If he can tear it down, he can build it back up. And so in the third verse, he comes and he said, "Now that I have shown you who I am, you know, you can call on me. I got the answers. I got the way." I'm the one who is able to give you hope. I'm the one who's able to fix what is broken, like you said, 
that God is the one who is able to fix our brokenness. He can fix things that are broken and it looks like there is no return. God is the one who is able to. And so he said, now you call on me. And, I, and, and he said, if you call, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to be the one to be able to help you out. And I'm willing to help you out. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, this, is, this is wonderful. I'm, I'm going to just piggyback off of what was said. Because when you look at the second verse, I love it. And um, we hit the word established. We see when the word established, we understand that God is the one that called Israel out. They were no better than anybody else. So God said, look, I'm the one who established you and I'm able to keep you. But since you didn't do what I told you to do, Lord of God, since you transgressed, now we see this judgment. But likewise, I'm also the one who can reestablish you, Lord of God. So we see here, I love it. He said, yes, I establish you. I, I, I'm the reason why, but you know, I see this is hope. I see hope up front right now when God speaks here in the, in, in, in the second verse. We see it's hope. He says, just like I established you, I can reestablish you. I say, it, it's because of me. But see, now that you're going through this judgment, now that you can recognize who I am, because sometimes we get a little beside ourselves and we forget, you know, that God is the one who established us. Uh, we forget that now when God's speaking, it's important, it's imperative that we, what, adhere to whatever God's saying. But we know the people didn't. They just rejected and continued to do whatever they wanted to do. Glory to God. So we see here, but see, now that I have your attention, glory to God. Now that, that you acknowledge who I am, glory to God. I think it's wonderful. I am the one that's able to what? Reestablish you. There's hope, glory to God. There's always hope. Amen. I like what uh, Pastor Edward was saying, that when they call, they're not just going to call on God. But like he said, they're going to call on him with the understanding of who he is and believing that he is well able to perform what they are asking him for. And so uh, when I look at the second verse, God will blow our mind if we just call on him. He, he will blow our mind. Remind me of a, of a message Pastor uh, Newsom spoke. He said, let God blow your mind. The only way he's going to blow it is if we call on God and believe that he is well able to perform the things that we're asking him. And uh, he will blow our mind. He will show us things that not even the, no human has that capacity to give us. And so he will open up our eyes to see the things that we cannot see. And so here I see that he was going to, if Israel would call on God, he would help them to believe in the hope that he has given them. Sometimes we can't see with these natural eyes, you know, because you, some, these eyes tells us just what it looks like. But when God opened up our eyes, our spiritual eyes, he show us the impossible. He show us things that man cannot do, but only he can do. And that's why, and that's when we're able to give God the glory and not man. Amen. Thank you all for those comments. Um, with all those comments and the feedback, it pushed us to uh, verse 7. Because verse 3 is, was talking about what is the condition of Jerusalem at the time, which was explained. And verse 4 was talking about what does God promise to do for his people. And verse 5 states, what does God promise regarding the sins of the people? And verse 6 was describing what was the future atmosphere in Jerusalem at that time. Are there any questions before we go to verse 7? I noticed that God is saying, I will, I will, I will. And uh, me, these are his covenants that he has made with his people that he is going to do just what he said. Amen. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 7th and the 8th verse, 
which reads, And I will cause the captivity of Judea and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first, and I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. Here in verse 7 and 8, God promises to end the exile and bring both Judea and Israel back to their land, this is not just a physical restor restoration, but a spiritual one as well. God will cleanse them from their sins and grant full forgiveness. This verse reflects God's mercy and his desire to rebuild not just the physical city, but the hearts of his people. The word cleanse means to purify and to make clean, indicating God's forgiveness and the removal of sin. Pardon means and is a meaning to forgive and release from punishment showing the depths of God's mercy. Here, these verses remind us that God's forgiveness is complete. No matter how far we have fallen, God is willing to cleanse and restore us when we repent. His grace is greater than our failures, and this is offering us a new beginning. Are there any questions to verses 7 and 8? Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, verses 7 and 8. Amen. Um, I thank God for that, because this is God's promising uh, of cleansing the house, you know. Uh, Judah and Israel. This is God's promise that he's going to do some cleaning here. And so I thought about Haggai, um, uh, Haggai 2 and 3. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? You know, and Israel and Judah knew their condition prior to their captivity. And not only did they know their condition, God had promised it brought them into a land flowing with milk and honey, and they lost everything. You know, but now God is promising a complete cleansing and a complete restoration. And that let us know, even those that are viewing by way of Facebook and YouTube, no matter how dirty we get, no matter how stained we become, God is able to cleanse us. And that's why uh, even when you look in, in, in David's uh, prayer, when David acknowledged his sins and his transgression, and he said, and he, told, and he asked the Lord to purge him with hyssop. He said, I shall be clean. He said, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So we see that God is in the restoration business. God is in the cleansing business. All we have to do is like we said previously, and David also did, was acknowledge our sins and our transgressions. Thank you. Amen. Are there any more comments? I just want to comment on, on the, the destruction, you know, of uh, Judah and, and uh, Jerusalem. And, you know, it, the, the significance, you know, of all the dead bodies, you know, you know, was 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 dad died and laid before them, you know their children, you know, the king's children, you know, and you know, it, it was a a deep 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 depression, you know, that was upon them. But they had to learn that because they had forsaken their God, you know, and. Yeah, it, it, it was their mistake. It wasn't God's mistake. It was their mistake, you know. And they were warned, you know, from the Moses law that if they turned, you know, from God, that God would, would let his enemy, let, let their enemy come upon them and, and, and take their city, you know. And, but they did not heed to the God's warning, you know. We as today, you know, we must heed to God's warning, you know. We must, we must repent, you know, and come to God, you know, because God is going to allow 
you to go so far with your sin, and then he going then judgment's gonna come. It's best to repent now and save yourself hardship than to, than than to allow hardship to come upon you because you know it, it's a great suffering you know to let hardship come upon you and let judgment come. Amen. Thank you for those comments. In Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter and the ninth verse, which reads, And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto you, unto it. Here, God's restoration of Jerusalem will not only benefit his people, but it will also bring glory to his name throughout the world. The nations will witness God's goodness right. and power, and they will stand in awe of his ability to bring prosperity and healing. This verse emphasizes that God's work in restoring his people is a testimony to his greatness for all to see. The word fear refers to reverence or awe indicating how the nation will respond to God's goodness. The goodness signifies God's abundant blessing, kindness, and favor. When God works in our lives, it becomes a testimony to others. His restoration not only blesses us, but it also shows the world his power and love. Our lives can reflect his goodness and lead others to honor him. Do anyone have any comments to verse 9? Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 10th and 11th verse reads, Thus says the Lord, Again, there shall be heard in this place, which ye shall say, which it shall be dissolute, without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judea and in the cities of Jerusalem that are dissolute, without man and without, inhabitate, and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land, and at the first, says the Lord. In verses 10 and 11, God paints a picture of future joy and celebration in a city that is now dissolute. Where there is currently death and destruction, there will come once again be the sounds of happiness, weddings, celebrations, and praises to God. The people will offer sacrifices of thanksgiving recognizing God's enduring mercy. This final verse emphasizes God's ability to turn devastation into joy. The word joy refers to gladness or happiness. The word mercy, God's steadfast love, loyalty, and kindness whichever falls, whichever fails, even in the face of human sin. Even when our circumstances seem hopeless, God promises restoration and joy. This passage 
ensures us that God's mercy is everlasting and he will always and he is always able to bring new life and celebration where there was once only sorrow. At this time, do anyone have any comments to verses 10 and 11? Jeremiah prophesied, you know, that at the end was going to come, you know, and destruction was going to come upon them if they didn't repent. And, you know, they, that the Bible said that you would know the prophet by when it comes true. So they know that Jeremiah was the true prophet, regardless of all the suffering that Jeremiah went through in you know, the prison and the, and, the, and the courtyard and stuff and being isolated, you know. He never gave up, you know, as we had we heard. But, you know, that we need, to, we need to understand, you know, that God is a merciful God, you know. And he, 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 he wants everyone to repent, you know, including this world that we're living in now, you know. They have a chance to repent, you know. And the time is now, you know. Repent now while you still have the time. Amen. Thank you for those comments. Today we came from Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the 2nd through the 11th verse. And the title of our lesson today was entitled, was titled, Improbable Possibilities. Today's lesson shows God's promises to restore his people despite their failures and Jerusalem destruction. Through Judea face judgment, God assured them of forgiveness, healing and return of joy, and the return to joy. Even in the darkest time, God's power can restore what seems impossible. God promises a restoration are true today. No matter how broken things seem, we can call on him and trust in his renewal. Today, I hope you enjoyed today's Sunday school lesson, which was titled Improbable po Possibilities. We look forward to your presence next week. As a note, if you would like to support Be Ye Holy Ministries through giving, you can click on the link in this video or go to our webpage at www.beyeholyministries.org. Thank you for attending this awesome service. Please join us via Facebook or YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and select the bell symbol so you'll be notified when we go live. Thank you for attending. Come fellowship with us again, and may God bless you.